tracks. Why you always gotta pick riff tracks? It's your lucky day. It's time for riff tracks. Hello, I'm Faith, and welcome to Faith's Take, where I talk about anything and everything that I find interesting. And welcome to episode 33 of Every Rift Track Short Reviewed, where I take five Rift Track shorts in chronological order, review them, and give them a rating between one and five, with the points being good, great, awesome, fantastic, and spectacular, because I don't think a bad Rift Track short exists. When I realized the shorts we had coming today, I got super excited, so let's just dive right into episode 33 of Every Rift Track Short Reviewed. Number 161, Beginning Responsibility, The Broken Bookshop, from November 11th, 2011. Andy loved books. Reuben knew that. But he also knew books don't love back, having married a few. If you remember the last episode, we took a trip to Grammaria and met the kooky old sentence smith. Well, the man featured in today's short must be his American cousin, because the bookshop owner named Reuben is just as, if not more insane, as Mr. Smith was, if that's even humanly possible. You see, our book-loving friend here owns a shop where he repairs old and unloved books. Sounds like an old-fashioned and noble effort at first, but the twist here is that the books actually talk to him. It doesn't appear that the books ever talked to any of the previous owners, who apparently physically abused and mentally scarred them in the first place. So either the books on all of our shelves are extremely shy, or this man's a few pages short of an encyclopedia if you catch my drift. The Broken Bookshop. Not to be confused with Borders, The Broke Bookshop. Some people in this world just love books. They're called desperate Ruben, loners. The man who his broken bookshop. Next door to the far more popular but good condition bookshop. Ordinary bookshop. Still, talking books are slightly more plausible than the idea that a man runs a business repairing old books. He wanted books to live forever because they had so many good things to say. Yeah, wanting things to live forever, a, a common desire of non-insane people. Ruben, look at all of us poor, hurt books. Oh, the terrible stories we could tell. Terrible stories of Bella here. and Edward. My Once I lived in a nice house with a girl and her brother. Their parents were a I thing of the past. Not like... Eat it, book. She didn't even look for a bookmark. She folded my page. But that wasn't the worst thing that happened to me. My brother was murdered. For now I knew why some of the other books looked like they'd been chewed on. They had. Right, got that. By the dog. Yes. The dog liked books. Yes! And the books couldn't wait to be read again. Sometimes, a book would even try to get into the box before it had been fixed. Oh, God, conditions here are horrible. Like that, Please let me in. Reuben, there's a book in the box who isn't fixed yet. Get him! <laughs> One day, a little boy named Andy comes to visit Reuben's shop, which has been unsurprisingly customer-free until now. He ends up borrowing a joke book and claims to take great care of it before returning. Unfortunately, Andy has crummy, thieving friends who snatch the book from his bag only for it to get ruined by a sprinkler. Andy, heartbroken by the ordeal, brings it back to get it fixed, and as a reward, I guess, and to help him feel better from the accident, Reuben lets Andy in on his psychosis. Since Andy's only eight years old, instead of helping Reuben seek therapy and medication for these issues, he just takes the job and becomes an apprentice. <laughs> hey, you should have seen me when I came in! Look at me now! Now I can make people laugh again! <laughs> Caesar Romero in a voiceover cameo. Well, would you like something else? Reuben, only dimly aware of where he is. Me! Me! Shush, this one will keep you up at night with its hideous laugh, but give it a shot! And took it to soccer practice that evening. What kind of insect gets A's in school? I don't know! A spelling bee! And he quickly became unpopular. I have a real book. It's in my book bag. Which I've lined with razor blades in case someone tries to take something from it. took the book out of the bag, but Andy didn't notice. The resulting feud would haunt their families for generations. Andy, this is going to cost you a thumb. I feel so bad. I love books. And look what I did. Now oh, I know my love is nothing but poison, thanks to Reuben books. Reuben could see. You know, I've decided to get some summer help. Andy ignored him with every fiber of his being. Would you like... Reuben decided to share his wonderful secret. My books talk to me. I gotta go home. This short is better than the funniest joke book out there, and I've got to give it a five out of five. I've got a delivery to make. Let's go. 
Despite the dubious business model, Ruben made millions of dollars a year restoring old joke books and hand delivering them. Number 162, Corky the Crow from December 7th, 2011. He is watching Farmer Miller plant corn. He's a crow. He truly has nothing better to do. Here we have another animal short that's pretty standard. We have a bunch of silent footage with the narrator over the top inserting a story to feature an animal in some kind of meaningful way. In this case, here we have a farm family tending to their crops when the stupid local crows won't stay out of their way. The father of the family decides that crows make good pets, a stereotype about crows I'd never heard before, and helps his kids catch one for themselves. And I'm sorry, but if the crow can't riff movies or sing about flying elephants, I see no use for it. The part of Miss Marie Stuckey will be played by Michael Chiklis in drag. Today we are going to see a film about a crow. Do you know what a crow is? If not, please if refer to our film, What a Crow Is. Inside the nest, there are three blue-green eggs with brown spots. Which is unfortunate, because they're supposed to be white. Ooh. Baby chest now, bursters. Two baby crows ah. are out of Father works, too, looking for food for the hungry little crows. But all he brings them to eat is other baby crows. Ah! They eat and eat, and then in ten days, the babies have their feathers. So now they can go out and get their own damn food. Bill and Mary are proud of their work. The bar is low in now this family. Now they hurry to tell their father. Are they surprised? The scarecrow doesn't work. The crows are not afraid of it. In fact, they've begun to worship father it. Father was puzzled. I will help you build a trap to catch one of them. Father's worst idea since the petting zoo full of wolverines. Corn and a mirror will attract the crows. They like shiny things. Corn and shiny things. They're going to trap a lot of people from Iowa. Will the trap work? Once a crow is officially captured by the children, they name him Corky and immediately start shoving human food down his gullet. After keeping him caged for a while, they release him, expecting him to stay just within the confines of the yard. And to the whole world's shock, he actually does. He plays with the kids and when they're not around, plays with their grandfather, never venturing out on his own or getting mauled by any of their other pets on the farm. However, he begins to envy his bird brethren and joins them in a flight for freedom in the winter. The narrator's optimistic he'll return to the children, but I think we all know how Corky's story will really end. And here comes another hungry crow. Eddie, what do you, weren't you watch? Oh, damn it, Eddie. Listen to him, Carl. He's in a special kind of hell right now. They like the crow. Suddenly and inexplicably. For two weeks, the children have taken good care of their pet. Eat your pop rocks. Corky, we love you more than our father. Please approve of us. Soon the summer ends, and now it's time for the children to go to school. World War I they flying a school in Mary's case. He's going to have a tug of war with Grandfather. Then a quick death by cat. Oh, Corky. Corky is tired, so he wants to play an easier game with Grandfather. A game of thrones. It is fall now. The days pass and get cooler. They get less uptight and start reading beat Some poetry. Crows are in the spring... Corky will be back again with the other crows. Putting on college boy airs and spouting fancy big city ideas. When Corky comes back next year, do you think he will remember Bill and Mary? Hell, I don't even remember them. Questions. Well, the short may be standard, the riffs are top-notch, and this one gets a four out of five. This is the trap that Farmer Miller built to catch a crow. Fat government subsidies give Farmer Miller plenty of time to build crow traps, muskrat houses, little flowered hats for his cows, a capybara pond, uh, maybe an air hockey table for his bonobo colony. Okay, okay. Number 163, reading from now on from January 3rd, 2012. Shot from the point of view of Tommy's friend after they mugged him, took his lunch, and left him for dead. We open with a couple of young boys window shopping on their way to school. The younger one, named Mike, pesters his older brother Tommy to read the various signs and such until Tommy just gets completely fed up with them. Mike laments about how he'll never learn to read, but from my experience, a kid at Mike's age who's so excited to learn to read should already know how to read, or at the very least sound out simple words. This kid isn't three, he's like seven. It'd be different if he didn't want to read and refused to learn, but he clearly wants to and doesn't seem to recognize a single letter. Things get even worse for Mike as he joins his reading group at school. Boy, short sleeve turtlenecks sure are keen. What's that say, Tommy? Dun dun dun. Oh, maybe not. It's 
Come on, let's get to school. Just tell me what it says. Read it yourself. Didn't you see the title? It's reading from now on. Nothing else. You can read. I can't. I don't think I'll ever learn. What do you think you're going to school for? To pick on the ESL kids? I got a B minus. And the green group is going to come up and form a reading circle. Damn. Well played, my old nemesis. Boys and girls, these are our new words for today. They have never been uttered before. First, I'll say them. Red. Red. The perfect crime. After school, Mike keeps whining about his lack of literacy until Tommy simply starts demanding he read the signs around them, insisting he must already know how. Apparently, little Mike was just delusional this whole time, as it turns out he can't read the words tree and red with pictures given to him in class, but out in the real world, he's suddenly able to read any word he comes across. So instead of actually teaching children to read, I guess we just have to convince him that the power has been inside them all along. Hey, have you heard that new song, Magic Carpet Ride, by Steppenwolf? Steppenwolf's great. They're gonna have way more hits than the Beatles. Come on. Far as they walked, the boys never escaped the pan fluting of Zamfir. How many words? Four. Four? That isn't hard. Look, Timmy, there are no shorter buses for you at this point. Wow, you got it right in. Because I can read. Huh? What does that say? Tahunga Avenue. That says shoe. The thing Grandpa's always bitching he never had. Good morning, boys and girls. You look bright and fresh and ready for school this morning. I sure as hell am well, not. Mr. Goodbar played rough last night. Mike, do you think you can read the four words on the board? Yeah, panicking. I better fake a heart attack. Tree. You. Badgering harpy. Mm -hmm. I, I mean me. The short may not make any sense, but it's hilarious, and it gets a three and a half out of five. That night, Mike devoured the collected works of Charles Bukowski. Within a year, he was a hopeless alcoholic, a vicious bar fighter, and a beloved published poet in France. Number 164, Friends, from January 24th, 2012. Goodbye. My God, children's lives before video games were sheer hell. Let's get depressed, shall we? After watching a young brunette girl scramble around her house gathering an old TV antenna and who knows what else, we see an obviously outcast girl at a playground. While the brunette drags her sack of garbage across the asphalt, the outcast offers to pay her to play with her. And that pretty much sums up the sad, empty tone of this short. The brunette turns her down and goes to play with her friend, the melancholy one with bangs. And no, despite having seen this short innumerable times, I don't remember any of the girls' names. The duo start using the brunette's junk heap to build a tent, and it may just be the most joyless act of childhood I've ever seen. See, no one told you life was gonna be this way. Sure, I can find some way to weaponize this. All children were harmed in the making of this film. Well, time for a bit of the old ultraviolence, I guess. Ah, the plot thickens. This is just like when De Niro and Pacino met for the first time in Heat. But just to warn you, spoiler alert, the ending is way bloodier. Yeah, the way these kids managed to get a whole squad of L.A. detectives impaled on that aerial. Well, you may not want to see how they do it. Hey, I'll give you half of my allowance. Buying friends. Look familiar, Bill? <laughs> no. Hand me the blanket. And don't make a big deal about the body underneath, okay? This is exactly what happened between Lennon and McCartney. They tried to put up a tent Why together? Yes. Me? Okay. No, wrong here. What are you. No! Have you ever assembled refuse to form a dwelling before? <laughs> They were surprised to find Nick Nolte had already moved in. Yeah, sorry girls, I just gotta sleep off this NyQuil buzz. Mr. Nolte, you have to leave! Uh, let's, let's give me another hour, kids. <laughs> I am Dr. Frankenstein. The protagonist in the Mary Shelley's Frankie. book alternately titled yeah. The Modern Prometheus. Frankie, this is a chain that I found near the... Chicken house. You stole a chicken necklace? <laughs> I think the um came up and kissed me while I was looking at a butterfly. And I looked around. And then I gave it back to him. After that, it got kind of <laughs> steamy. 
The next day, all three of our characters end up on the playground. The outcast asks the duo if they'd like to partake in a good old-fashioned plum fight, which the miserable girl who could give Eero one for his money refuses, opting to cry instead. The bossy brunette goes to join the plum fight, which just consists of a bunch of random kids snatching underripe plums and throwing them at each other for no discernible reason outside of pure chaos and boredom. Eventually, the sad one walks past their plum-coated battlefield as the others begin to taunt and torment her. And trust me, it's even more uncomfortable than I'm making it sound. After running off and destroying their tent, the teary-eyed one refuses to hear out her old friend as she goes to apologize. And that's it. No reconciliation, no love, no friendship. Ah, here comes the neighborhood kid who thinks she's a robot pigeon. The classic game of pushing each other around hasn't changed at all. Doesn't anybody want to have a plum fight? I'll show you my booger scrapbook. I'm still recovering from yesterday's wicked muskmelon fight. I want to have more than just one friend. I don't want to be the Heidi Montag of the fourth grade. You can if you're gonna feel that way about it. I might as well go with her. You'll never see the stained underside of my lice ridden blanket again. You ever wish we had parents? Nah, being feral's way more fun. I'll go up here and get some plums. Ah, the traditional childhood plum fight at the miniature castle ruins. Here. I took some plum shrapnel to the leg. Go on without me. I'm gonna tell your mother on you, Nancy. You're not supposed to be in there. The twelve minute hair pulling profanity laced girl fight that follows will shock the most jaded viewer. Discretion you is advised. People. What a little baby you are, always tattletaling on people. Don't okay, make me cut you. And an entire herd of rats scatters to find new shelter. Shame. It ruins what would otherwise be a very, very lovely spot. Her plans to one day have their wedding service here have been dealt a severe blow. The short seemingly only exists to show us that life, even as a child, can be a cold, dark void. But thankfully, Mike, Kevin, and Bill fill the void with hilarity and get this one a four and a half out of five. Ah, childhood days, playing with dangerous trash, crushing bugs, bribing insane peers in order to alleviate loneliness. Such innocence. Yeah. Number 165, The Lemonade Stand, What's Fair, from January 31st, 2012. Here's a seed for you. When you take a sip, stir it up at the bottom and get your taste much better that way. Sure I will, but first, why did you just go, ah, are you okay? <laughs> Here we start with a pair of best friends creating a lemonade stand together while one of the boys' little brother watches enviously. For some unexplained reason, the older boy seemed to hate the younger for nothing other than pure contempt, constantly tearing him down for just existing. And if there's anything the last short taught us, is that three kids, a bizarre childhood project, and a seemingly strong friendship could never turn out badly for all three children involved, and never ever makes the audience feel like life is meaningless. I want to do a chill. You are too little. Also, I loathe you. Uh, yeah, a vicious one. If it'll hold still, try and hold it. Seriously, it's vicious. It, it pulled a knife on me. Yeah. There's a lot of seeds in there. Yeah, there are. Later on, we might pick out a few for you. Oh, you'll They're pick out a few lemon seeds, seeds for me, me, huh? Why do you hate me so much? Oh, I guess I'll get a new bike. Bikes cost a lot of money. Well, yeah. thanks for dumping on my dream. The music makes me think that both their mothers just died. Let me see. Something I can do now that Grandpa gave me his old glasses. <laughs> the hell are you doing yeah, here? Just From the film series, plunging your third grader into existential despair. Hey gang, what you doing? We're selling lemonade. Would you like some? Yeah, might have deduced that from the yeah, lemonade yeah, and the sign free. that says lemonade for sale. Free. It's only a nickel! No, oh, you idiot! We just raised the price! Oh god, we're ruined thanks to you! As the day wears on with nearly a customer in sight, the kids break for lunch. While at home, Blondie has a couple other friends convince him to come play baseball and ditch the lemonade stand, without telling his friend, of course. Meanwhile, the brothers run the stand, with the little bro getting a whole gang of construction workers to come check it out. 
After the lemonade rush, the lazy slug comes back demanding his share of the money despite abandoning his friend. And while internally struggling between keeping the money, giving some to his friend, or giving the rightful share to his little brother who clearly deserves it, the short just ends. Once again, no answers given, just burning existential questions. Maybe it's time to switch locations to a more trafficked area, like inside a locked self-storage unit. Did you see what time it was? He doesn't know how to tell time yet. I can barely remember how to breathe. Mom, what time it is. Jack and Steve were asking for you a little while ago. What'd they want? They said something about 12 large ball. and a vig. Mm, I'm selling lemonade over at Bill's house. Lemonade? That's girl stuff! Yeah, what do you want to be, a girl or a boy? I'm undeclared. I make money off it. You could make an even better profit being a Major League Baseball player, and now it's the time to get experience. Damn, yeah. his logic is airtight. Yeah, we... Because, you know, kids just love Renaissance recorder music. Wow, cool. Ten guys standing around and smoking while one guy works. Man, standing around is thirsty work. Hey, Sam, we're out of water. I'm 300 years old. It's cute to pretend these thirsty blue-collar dudes would turn to lemonade instead of nine beers apiece. That's the best watered-down, lukewarm lemonade I've tasted all day. Wow, we made more money today than Dad did. Come on, Jay, let's go into the house. Hi there, how's business? Pretty good. How's leisure? Three dollars. Yeah, but you didn't do anything. What should I give you? The business Here's dispute sugar. that inspired the acclaimed film, The Social Please Network. The lemons. You'll be hearing from my attorney. Good day to you, sir. It's time for me to do what's fair and give this short a five out of five. Conclusion, we all die alone and afraid, knowing no one truly loved us. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and special thanks to all my beautiful Patreon supporters, including Jackie Ball, Kevin Nata, and Jill Johnson. As you may have noticed, I've been having a ton of fun with my Google Image videos lately, and I'm branching out past Mystery Science and Rift Tracks into Muppets and soon Disney songs as well. Also, I will finally be getting back into reviewing Mystery Science Season 1 and into the Rift Treks Live review in the upcoming weeks. And unsurprisingly, a lot of YouTubers are having issues getting their videos to show up in their subscriber feeds, so if any of those videos sound interesting to you, please click the little bell button if you haven't, even if you're already subscribed, or you could check out my Twitter or website with the links in the description to not miss any of them. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys later.